everyone, and welcome to Drawing the Vasculature of the Upper Extremity. I'm your friendly anatomy PTA, Randy, and today I will be sharing with you an easy way to work through drawing the arteries and learning them piecewise, and you will find that it's not quite as overwhelming as it seems, especially when you take it in pieces. So here is the schema of which if you want to practice on your own, you can draw this on your own. These are all of the arteries that we are going to be going through today. And I have broken it up for you already in pieces of the thoracic cage, the axilla, which is another word for the armpit, the arm, the forearm, and the hand. So notice now that we have arm versus forearm. So the arm is from your shoulder to your elbow and your forearm is from your elbow to your wrist. So this is the way I like to learn the upper extremity and I learn from the parent artery in each of these little sections. So we'll start with the thoracic cage, starting at the heart is always a good place. And the parent artery for our thoracic cage is the subclavian artery. So all blood supply to the body begins at the heart. The left ventricle of the heart has a large artery coming from it called the arch of the aorta and the aorta can almost be considered as the parent artery for the entirety of the body. The aorta itself continues inferiorly to pierce the diaphragm at about the level of T12 and will provide blood supply to the abdomen and the lower limbs but as we are concerned with the upper extremity in this video we are going to focus on these three branches. So the way that I like to remember these three branches is the mnemonic of ABCs. So, going from left to right, as you are looking at the patient, but remember, as we are looking at the patient, this is the right side of the patient, and this is the left side of the patient. So we also have sidedness in our branching patterns. So ABCs, we learn from left to right as we learn to read. So A, we already know, for arch of the aorta. Then we have B, C, S. So A, B, Cs. So A, arch of the aorta. B for brachiocephalic trunk. C stands for common carotid artery. Now remember, I mentioned there is sidedness. This artery is specifically the left common carotid artery. And S, subclavian, the left subclavian artery. The way that I like to learn and I remember these vessels is I'm right-handed, so I actually stick out my right hand in front of me in anatomical position and look at it as I'm visualizing these blood vessels and their pathways. So we are going to continue along the right arm of this patient. So the brachiocephalic trunk gives off a branch that heads superiorly. This is the right common carotid artery. So remember, these are paired. After the sub after the brachiocephalic trunk gives off the right common carotid artery, it becomes the right subclavian artery. So notice, again, the branching pattern is different between the right and the left. The left comes directly off, the, off of the aorta, while the right is basically a continuation of the brachiocephalic trunk. The next branch coming off the right subclavian artery as we move from proximally to distally is this small artery, the vertebral artery. Now, the, the common carotids in the vertebral artery, we aren't going to discuss now, that's more in the head and neck lecture. The common carotid artery will eventually split into an external and an internal carotid artery. So the external supplies a lot of the neck and face, while the internal carotid artery travels up to the, bra up to the brain and provides blood supply to the anterior circle of Willis. The vertebral artery travels through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae and provides the posterior blood supply to the circle of Willis. Our next branch, as we move distally along the subclavian artery, remember subclavian artery is our parent artery for the thoracic cage, we have a vessel traveling inferiorly. This vessel is the internal thoracic artery, also sometimes called the internal mammillary, artery because it supplies the breasts in addition to the anterior chest wall via the anterior intercostal arteries. So fun fact, this internal thoracic artery is often sampled for coronary artery bypass graft to treat a myocardial infarction. So that is known as a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. As we travel distally, we have a branch that comes off superiorly called the thyrocervical trunk. And this thyrocervical trunk 
has its own arteries. These are the inferior thyroid artery, the transverse cervical artery, and the suprascapular artery. The suprascapular artery we are going to discuss a little bit more when we talk about the posterior shoulder. And what I want you to remember about these two other arteries is that the inferior thyroid artery provides blood supply to the thyroid, and the transverse cervical artery provides blood supply to the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Not sole blood supply, but it gives a little bit. Before the subclavian artery can leave the thoracic outlet, it has to pass through a small tunnel formed by these two muscles attaching to a rib, specifically the first rib. And these muscles are the anterior scalene muscle and middle scalene muscle, and their function is to help elevate that first rib. These are called accessory muscles of respiration, which means that if my patient is using these two muscles to help elevate the first rib to expand the thoracic cage to aid in breathing, they have very, very labored breath and will require assistance. So the anterior middle scalene raised the first rib, but we also have a posterior scalene. So the mnemonic that I like to use to remember these different scalene muscles is I get up at 1 a.m. to pee. So AM, the anterior and middle scalene, attached to the first rib, while the posterior scalene attaches to the second rib, and that will become very, very important in OPP. So as the subclavian artery passes this line, this landmark, the, it becomes the axillary artery, and we call this landmark the lateral border of the first rib. So notice that the subclavian artery doesn't give a branch of the axillary artery, the right subclavian artery becomes the axillary artery once it passes a certain landmark, and you will find that this is a paradigm that will be true of a lot of the upper extremity. Let us move forward with the axilla, which is outlined in yellow. The parent artery for the axilla is the axillary artery. So axilla, again, outlined in yellow. So here's our anterior middle scalene as they attach to the first rib lateral border of rib one, and remember that the subclavian artery remains the subclavian artery until it passes this border, and then it becomes the axillary artery. It will remain the axillary artery until its next border, which is this muscle, the teres major muscle, and the axillary artery then becomes the brachial artery at this landmark, the inferior border of the teres major muscle. So, lateral border of rib one to inferior border of teres major muscle is the axillary artery. The branches of the axillary artery are best learned in relation to this guy. This muscle is the pectoralis minor muscle, and the axillary artery can be divided into three parts in relation to this muscle. The first part that is proximal, the second part which is deep, and the third part which is distal. So this pectoralis minor muscle, uh, he's in our way right now, so let's get rid of him and learn the branches of our axillary artery. So there are two branches in this first part, a third branch in the second part, and three branches in our third part. The way that I like to remember the order that these branch is with the mnemonic, 60s teens love sex and pot. So 60s teens are in the first part, love, second part, sex, and pot in the third part. Now, S stands for superior thoracic artery, T for thoracoacromial trunk. So notice, this is the thoracoacromial trunk in the axillary artery, not the thyrocervical trunk, which is in the subclavian artery. Be careful not to get them confused. And the thoracoacromial trunk has branches that provide blood supply to the shoulder, and these branches are named for where they go. Our next branch, which is inferior and deep to the pectoralis minor, because most more often than not, the thoracoacromial trunk traverses superiorly and superficially to the pectoralis minor. So this next branch, our L, is the lateral thoracic artery, and the lateral thoracic artery will travel anteriorly and provide blood to the serratus anterior muscle. The next branch, also traveling anteriorly, is the subscapular artery, and this is a rather larger artery that has two branches, the circumflex scapular, 
which travels posteriorly to supply the posterior part of the scapula, and the thoracodorsal artery, which travels to the latissimus dorsi muscle. A is going to stand for anterior circumflex humeral artery, whereas P stands for posterior circumflex humeral artery. These arteries do what their name implies and encircle the humerus, providing blood supply to the bone. So while they branch off of the axillary artery relatively close to one another, they are going to traverse the humerus in a different manner. And an easy way to tell these apart is more often than not, the posterior circumflex humeral artery is a little bit larger than the anterior circumflex humeral artery. Now that we've learned the branching pattern of the axillary artery, there are a few neurovascular bundles that I want to draw your attention to. The first and the largest is this one from the brachial plexus, the posterior cord, named posterior cord because it is posterior to our axillary artery. And as the posterior cord continues distally, it's going to give off a branch that travels with this artery, our posterior circumflex humeral artery. And this branch, actually one of the terminal branches of your brachial plexus, is the axillary nerve. And this is one of the ways that you can tell the difference between the posterior and the anterior circumflex humeral artery, is that not only is the posterior a little bit bigger in most cases than the anterior, but it will also have this axillary nerve traveling with it. So after the posterior cord gives off the axillary nerve, it becomes the radial nerve, which is another terminal branch of your brachial plexus. So notice how I said that. The posterior cord becomes the radial nerve after it gives off the, the branch axillary nerve. So this neurovascular bundle can be damaged in an anterior dislocation of your shoulder. So whenever it is damaged, you will therefore have potentially muscle wasting of the muscle supplied by the damaged nerve. In this case, the deltoid muscle and the teres minor muscle. So the deltoid muscle is responsible for a lot of the adduction. So notice how I said that too as well. Abduction is different than adduction, and I capitalize the AD as well, because especially when you guys are learning this for the first part, abduction and adduction sound so similar that it can often be confused. So go ahead and say adduction and adduction and capitalize it. It'll help you, I promise. So you'll also have damage to your teres minor muscle, which will result in weakness in shoulder external rotation. The next neurovascular bundle is a nerve that travels with this artery. This artery is the lateral thoracic artery, and it is paired with the long thoracic nerve. So be careful here. Don't get these confused. Don't say lateral thoracic nerve or long thoracic artery. It is long thoracic nerve and lateral thoracic artery. These guys, when damaged, will cause a condition called winged scapula due to the paralysis of the muscle that they supply, the serratus anterior muscle. The serratus anterior muscle's job is to pull the scapula anteriorly so it's snug against your, snug against your back so that when you lose this muscle, if, I, if you were to ask your patient to place the flat of their hands on a wall and straighten their arms, the scapula will wing off of the back because there's no longer a muscle pulling it anteriorly. The next is one traveling with this artery, the thoracodorsal artery, and thankfully this is named thoracodorsal nerve. And this will result in damage to the muscle that they supply, which is the latissimus dorsi. And a lot of the problems that your patients will complain here will be of they can't open doors because they will have lost that shoulder extension and they are unable to wipe after they have a bowel movement. So while we're still in the axilla, I would like to move on and discuss the posterior shoulder. So what we're looking at right now is a right scapula. So we are looking at it from the posterior view. So this is the medial side of the scapula, angle of the scapula, and follow it up, here's the coracoid process, the spine of the scapula, and the acromial process. So our clavicle would attach right here. So I'm outlining with my cursor where the clavicle would be, but I didn't want to muck up the picture. It'd, it'd just be a little bit too much on the screen. So I'm gonna also go in and add this humerus because we are going to focus 
on this section right here. So as we're still in the axilla, we're concerned with our axillary artery, which he will come anteriorly to this section of the scapula and continue down. Do you remember what this muscle is? Marks the transition from axillary artery to brachial artery. This is the teres major muscle. So this inferior border is where the axillary artery becomes the brachial artery. But again, teres major is in our way, so let's remove him. Before we go through and talk about the arteries, I want to draw your attention to this bony landmark, the little notch in the scapula, which I'm outlining in blue. This is the suprascapular notch, supra meaning superior scapula, because we're talking about the scapula. And there is a special ligament that overlies this notch called the superior transverse scapular ligament. And you will see his importance here in a minute. So I like learning my arteries from proximal to distal. So we're still going to focus once while we're dealing with the axillary artery. We're going to focus on our thyrocervical trunk to start, which is still considered in the subclavian artery. So the branch that I want you to pay attention to is this long branch. So this long branch coming off, going superior to the superior transverse scapular ligament and wrapping around the spine of the scapula is called the suprascapular artery. So we saw him before in a previous slide, but now we're going to see him as he comes through the scapula. The next branch is one that comes and is going to provide blood supply to the three muscles that attach to the medial portions of the scapula, your levator scapulae, and your rhomboid minor, and your rhomboid major. This artery is called the dorsal scapular artery. So let's continue to move distally. We're not going to worry about a lot of the branches of the axillary artery until we get to this one, the subscapular artery. So do you remember the two branches that come off of the subscapular artery? The first of these branches I'm going to talk about is the one that comes posteriorly and he'll form, start forming an anastomosis on the posterior part of the scapula. That is the circumflex scapular artery. So the other branch from the subscapular artery is one that will continue inferiorly and travels to lat the latissimus dorsi muscle. This is the thoracodorsal artery. So the circumflex scapular, there are many different branching patterns that can occur between all of these different arteries since they all, they all form anastomoses. So just remember that the circumflex scapular artery anastomoses with the dorsal scapular artery and sometimes you can even get branches connecting the thoracodorsal artery as well. But we don't expect you to remember these individual anastomoses, just remember that they exist. So our mnemonic for the axillary artery branches are six C's, teens, love, sex, and pot. So we have the subscapular artery. What branches come distal to the subscapular artery? They wrap around anteriorly to the humerus and then posteriorly to the humerus. These are the anterior circumflex humeral artery and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So here we can actually see they're a lot bigger than they seemed in my previous diagram. So remember this, that they anastomose out here. The last branch we're going to concern ourselves with in the posterior shoulder actually comes off of the brachial artery, not the axillary artery. And he is going to travel along the radial groove of the humerus. This is your deep brachial artery. And we'll talk about him a little bit more in subsequent slides. So that is the vasculature of the posterior shoulder. But there, again, are neurovascular bundles that I want you to remember. So our first one is our posterior cords, although we're seeing the posterior cord from the posterior view now. He gives off a branch that travels with the posterior circumflex humeral artery and then continues as a different nerve that travels with the deep brachial artery. Do you remember what this terminal branch was that travels with the posterior circumflex humeral artery? It's your axillary nerve. And the branch that can travels with the deep brachial artery then must be the radial nerve. We've already talked about how this neurovascular bundle can be damaged in an anterior shoulder dislocation, so let's talk about this neurovascular bundle, which can be damaged in a mid-shaft 
femoral fracture, which is basically a break right here in the middle of the humerus. And since the radial nerve provides motor innervation to the posterior arm and forearm, damage to this nerve would result in an inability to ex use our extensor muscles in those compartments. So you have what's called wrist drop, where I can't extend my wrist if these muscles are damaged. The next nerve we've seen before, it's traveling with the thoracodorsal artery, and we know its name is the thoracodorsal nerve and both of those are traveling through the latissimus dorsi muscle. The next nerve is one that travels along with the dorsal scapular artery along the medial border of the scapula, and that one is the dorsal scapular nerve, providing motor innervation to those same three muscles, the levator scapulae, the rhomboid minor, and the rhomboid major. Let's return to the axilla. Besides our posterior cord, we have another large nerve running medial to our brachial artery. This guy's name is the median nerve, and we will elaborate more on his function in subsequent slides. The last nerve I want you to remember in the posterior shoulder is a nerve that comes inferiorly traveling with the sub suprascapular artery, but instead of going over the superior transverse scapular ligament like the artery would, he is going through the suprascapular notch inferior to the superior transverse scapular ligament. And this one is the suprascapular nerve, and they will both wrap around the spine of the scapula and provide uh, blood supply and motor innervation to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. So there are a couple of spaces that I can illustrate for you right now that will help you in identifying the neurovascular bundles. So let us put some of the muscles in the posterior shoulder. So this one we're familiar with by this point, this is the teres major muscle. He originates from the inferior border of the scapula and inserts on the anterior aspect of the humerus, causing internal rotation. He has a teres minor above him that attaches from the, in the medial border of the scapula to the posterior aspect of the humerus. So he causes external rotation of the humerus. And remember, we talked about that. He's innervated by the axillary nerve. So damage to the axillary nerve will cause this teres minor to not function. So just with our rhomboids, minor is always superior to major. So notice that minor is superior to major in these teres muscles. Next, we're going to look at the posterior compartment of the arm, which is composed of the triceps muscles, specifically the triceps brachii muscles. So here we have one of the heads of the triceps uh, inserting on the inferior border of the scapula over here, deep to the teres minor muscle. This is the long head of our triceps brachii muscle. We have another head of the triceps that is inserting on the humerus, the lateral head of the triceps brachii muscle. So I want to draw your attention to this space here in green. This space, bordered superiorly by the teres minor, inferiorly by teres major, and laterally by the long head of the triceps brachii, is the triangular space through which the circumflex scapular artery is transmitting. So the reason I'm drawing your attention to these spaces is that if you can find the borders of these muscles and there is an artery going through this space, you know that that artery has to be the circumflex scapular artery. The next space, this one that's a square kind of, is the quadrangular space. And the quadrangular space transmits the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the axillary nerve. Our final space, we need to get rid of this lateral head of the tr uh, triceps brachii and look at the medial head of the triceps brachii. So here is our neurovascular bundle running along the radial groove that borders, that forms the superior border of the medial head of the triceps brachii. So this space is known as the triceps hiatus and it is transmitting the deep brachial artery and the radial nerve. All right, let us move on from the axilla to the arm and the parent artery for the arm is the brachial artery. So remember the arm is from your shoulder to your elbow, while the forearm is from your elbow to your wrist. 
this arm. Here's my brachial artery. And just to orient ourselves, let's place our posterior and anterior sacrofemoral arteries and put in our lateral border of the teres major muscle. So the brachial artery continues down the arm and around the area of the cubital fossa or sometimes in the forearm itself it will give off two branches one going laterally and one going medially so remember this is a good time to remind you of anatomical position where anatomical position is the palm facing anteriorly so the lateral side is the side that i like to remember with the thumb side so lateral equals thumb equals radial side Conversely, the medial side of our arm is the side with the pinky. So medial equals pinky equals ulnar. And this is the side that you will find, you know, the actual bone itself on. The radius is here, ulnar is here. So the lateral side is our radial artery. The medial side is our ulnar artery. So our radial side, the lateral side, is a little less complicated, so let's start with him first. We have a large artery starting from up in the arm that will come and anastomose with the radial artery. And this proximal branch is the deep brachial artery that turns into the radial recurrent artery at the elbow. So like the axillary artery turning into the brachial artery, this is the same artery. We just, ha we just call it something different once it passes a certain landmark. And that, in this case, is the elbow. So that's it for the lateral side. The medial side's a little bit more complicated. So we have two arteries coming from the medial side as opposed to the one. So let's follow this more superior one. So let's follow him. He is going to go posteriorly to this structure. And this structure is the medial epicondyle of your humerus. So he's going posteriorly to the medial epicondyle and will anastomose with the ulnar artery. So proximally, this more superior branch is the superior ulnar collateral artery. And as it continues distally and passes into the elbow, turns into the posterior ulnar recurrent artery. Conversely, if this is our superior branch, this must be our inferior branch. So we have a su excuse me, inferior ulnar collateral artery to our superior ulnar collateral artery. And just in before, we have an ulnar recurrent going posteriorly to this epicondyle. We have an ulnar recurrent going anterior to this epicondyle. So before we go through our mnemonics to remember which of these guys are paired with the other, let's go over our nerves. So here we have our posterior cord giving off a branch that travels with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. By now we should know this fairly well as the axillary nerve. So that means that this branch coming and traveling with the deep brachial artery is the radial nerve. And remember that the deep brachial artery and the radial nerve are responsible provi for providing the blood supply and the motor innervation to the posterior compartment of your arm and your forearm. We've also talked about this nerve before, one that travels medial to the brachial artery, traveling down through the cubital fossa, and will continue on into the forearm and eventually the hand. This is our median nerve. Our last nerve that we are concerned with in the arm is one that will come and travel posteriorly to the medial epicondyle and will travel for a short time with the posterior, posterior excuse me, ulnar recurrent artery and eventually travel with the ulnar artery. This is our ulnar nerve, and we will talk about him a little bit more in subsequent slides. So fun fact, you can actually palpate this neurovascular bundle on the posterior aspect of your medial epicondyle as they run in a little groove. So the nerve is traveling very superficial to the skin at this point, so it is very susceptible to temporary damage. So when you whack your bunny bone, this is where you're hitting that nerve, and you'll be able to feel the paresthesia or the numbness and tingling on the medial aspect of your forearm and in the tips of your medial two fingers. So pairing 
which artery in the arm goes with which elbow can be a little confusing at first, so let's address it individually. So the deep brachial artery in the arm is going to meet up with the radial recurrent artery in the elbow. And if the word recurrent is in this artery, it is in the elbow versus the collaterals, especially the ulnar collaterals are in the arm. So the superior ulnar collateral artery meets up with the posterior ulnar recurrent artery. So again, if it's in the elbow, it has recurrent in it. The inferior ulnar collateral artery meets up with the anterior ulnar recurrent artery. And these are often, it's really difficult to remember which one goes with what, so I have two mnemonics for you. One is that the vowels will go together, so inferior and anterior both start with vowels. Or the way that I remember it is just AI, artificial intelligence. So anterior goes to inferior. Let us move on to the forearm now. The forearm now has two parent arteries, the radial artery and the ulnar artery. So here comes our brachial artery from the arm, and it is going to split into two arteries like we saw in the previous slide. So remember, the thumb is your lateral side, it's where your radius is, and the pinky is your ulnar side. So this lateral side is radial artery, this medial side is ulnar artery. So the radial artery, besides the radial recurrent from the previous slide, doesn't really have much going on with it until you get to the hand. So let's focus on the ulnar artery. As we follow the ulnar artery distally, it is going to give off a branch laterally called the common interosseous artery. This common interosseous artery is going to branch again into an anterior and a posterior artery. And the posterior, though, has to pass through a structure called the interosseous membrane. And this interosseous membrane is just a thick membrane that connects and provides support between the radius and the ulna. And this membrane also separates the posterior and the anterior compartment of the forearm. And both of these arteries are running right on top of that membrane. So this is the anterior interosseous artery, the one that goes anteriorly. And the posterior one, surprise, goes is named posterior interosseous artery. So that's it basically for the vasculature. So let's learn our paired nerves. So the first one that runs with the ulnar artery is the ulnar nerve. And these guys will continue and travel together all the way down to the wrist. The next one is a branch that's coming from the deep branch of the radial nerve. So remember the radial nerve, those are posterior compartments and will travel and meet with the posterior interosseous artery, and his name is the posterior interosseous nerve. So the point that it transitions from the deep branch of the radial nerve to the posterior interosseous nerve is that this deep branch of the radial nerve is going to pierce the supinator muscle, and as soon as it emerges from the supinator muscle, it is known as the posterior interosseous nerve, and then these are going to travel together to provide uh, motor innervation and blood supply to the posterior compartment of the forearm. Our next nerve is one we've seen before a couple of times to the medial side of the brachial artery, our median nerve. And our median nerve is responsible for providing innervation to the anterior compartment of the forearm, at least almost all of the muscles, except for two, the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor carpi ulnaris, and both of these are innervated by the ulnar nerve instead. So the median nerve is going to make a beeline for the wrist where it will go through the carpal tunnel to provide motor innervation to the thenar eminence, the three muscles in there, and the first and second lumbricals. Before it goes to the carpal tunnel, it's going to give off a branch that travels laterally with the anterior interosseous artery, and this is, thankfully, the anterior interosseous nerve. So here's a table of paired arteries and nerves that we have discussed. The only one that I have not included in this table is the proper palmar digital arteries and nerves which are paired but that's one's fairly simple. So here, this table is filled out for you. 
and here it is not filled out. So try to go through and actually pair these arteries and nerves. It will not only help you with identifying these nerves in the lab, but will help you with your clinical correlates because board examiners very much like to test on these paired arteries and nerves. So also go through and fill in those clinical correlates as well. Now we are moving on to the hand. And the hand is a little bit different than the rest and its parent arteries are still the radial artery and ulnar artery, but they are given different names as they form these little arches in the hand. So those arches are the superficial palmar arch and the deep palmar arch. I've kept the picture of the hand on the slide to hopefully help you guys orient a little better because the hand can get really complicated. So to iterate, thumb, lateral side, pinky, medial side. So thumb, radius, pinky, ulna. So we are looking at a right hand in anatomical position. Our first artery on the pinky side is our ulnar artery. And as our ulnar artery continues distally, it will form this little arch that I talked about before. This is our superficial palmar arch. Named superficial because it is very, very superficial to the intrinsic hand muscles. It is just deep to that palmar aponeurosis. The superficial palmar arch will then travel back proximally to anastomose with this artery. So lateral side, radial artery. So those are the two parent arteries for our hand still. And notice, I colored radial artery blue and ulnar artery yellow. This is to hopefully help illustrate the difference that these arteries contribute in the blood supply of the hand. So let's continue following our radial artery. Our radial artery will travel posteriorly around the thumb and you can actually palpate the radial artery in the anatomical stuff box on the dorsum of the hand. If we were to take a radial pulse, however, we would come proximal to that thenar eminence. As we follow the radial artery around the hand, it will come back into the hand and anastomose at the ulnar artery as the deep palmar arch. So superficial palmar arch, ulnar artery, deep palmar arch, radial artery. Both of these palmar arches contribute to the blood supply of the digits. So from the superficial palmar arch, we have contributions, and from the deep palmar arch, we have contributions. So again, I'm playing into my color code here where blue plus red equals purple. These purple arteries are called the common palmar digital arteries, and they receive contributions from both arches, so superficial and deep. The contribution from the deep palmar arch are the palmar metacarpal arteries. And both of these forming the common palmar digital arteries then send out more arteries that travel on either side of each digit. These arteries in purple, the lighter purple, are the proper palmar digital arteries. And the way that I remember the difference between proper palmar and common palmar is if you're proper and you drink your tea like a sophisticated person, like you're properly, your pinky is extended. So proper run on either side of the digits. Common are the contributions from the palmar arches. I would like to next draw your attention to a few, our few remaining arteries. So the first one I want to talk about is from the radial artery. And the radial artery gives off this one the nutrient artery to the scaphoid. So scaphoid, scaphoid bone, it's one of your carpal bones. It is the one that is most lateral and proximal. Special clinical correlate for this is that, it see how it loops here? It goes distally and then it comes back around proximally. So occasionally if you'll have a fracture of your scaphoid bone, so for example, if the artery were ligated here, I would no longer have blood flow to the more proximal part of the scaphoid bone and that is called retrograde flow. So we can get avascular necrosis of the scaphoid bone. The next two arteries are these ones that look like proper palmar digital arteries, but they're their own special ones. So let's get this out of the way. The first is princeps pollicis. So remember pollicis means thumb. And radialis indices. So that one, 
unfortunately, you just have to memorize it. Radialis, you know, it's lateral, and then indices, it is on your first finger, your index finger. And that concludes the drawing portion of this video. These next few slides are going to be a review. So here's our schema. I advise you to learn this as well as you possibly can. So draw it over and over and over again. It's like your brachial plexus. The more you draw it, the easier it will be to help you identify these in your donor. So remember also that I presented to you the most common branching patterns. It may, might not be this way in your donor. We name things for where they go and what they do, not necessarily the order in which they branch. So without further ado, we are going to go through a click and show with this drawing, labeling all of the arteries from the heart to the digits. And we will start with the thoracic cage. The parent artery of the thoracic cage is the subclavian artery. And now we will start at the heart and move on. Let us move on to the axilla. Name the parent artery of the axilla. Axillary artery. Do you remember our mnemonic for the order in for the common branching patterns? 60s teens love sex and pot. Name the artery and its paired nerve in the axilla. Moving on to the arm. Name the parent artery of the arm. The brachial artery. Name the paired arteries and nerves in the arm. Moving on to the forearm. What are the parent arteries of the forearm and hand? We'll do them both at the same time. The radial artery and the ulnar artery. And remembering in the hand, the ulnar artery contributes to the superficial palmar arch, while the radial artery contributes to the deep palmar arch. Name the paired arteries and nerves in the forearm or hand. And we've seen this table before. I hope you all have found this useful, and I will see you next time. And we've seen this table before on an earlier slide. I hope you all learned something. This concludes our video for drawing the vasculature of the upper extremity. I'll see you next time.